at various times in St. Paul's letters, we hear a rather shocking statement when he tells us, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. And at first glance, this could seem very proud of a saint to say, do what I'm doing. But when we see the whole context of his life, we recognize that St. Paul is so totally conformed to Christ that what he's asking of others is not his own personal interpretation, it's not his own particular desires, it is the very will of God working through him. And so when he says, be imitators of me, he's really saying, do what Jesus would do, because he is acting as Christ would. In today's second reading, we have a particular instance of this. He's telling us that he knows how to live in humble circumstances and with abundance. The, the secret of being well-fed and going hungry, of living in abundance and being in need. He sets up these two pillars, if you will, these two ends of the spectrum, where there's poverty and destitution on one end and overabundant surplus on the other. In general, we can see the difficulties of either case. Living in Gallup as we do, we can see the many situations that lead to poverty or keep it going, and how difficult that can make life for people. The lack of food or water, the lack of money, the lack of health care, whatever it might be, how difficult that can make life for people. And yet St. Paul is saying he understands that. He's writing this letter from prison. Everything has been taken from him. And you can see in 2 Corinthians all the ways in which he suffered. He goes through many lists saying, I have been beaten. I have undergone stoning and flogging. I've been shipwrecked. I've been without food. And yet, he follows Christ. On the other hand, we can see the other extreme of wealth and abundance of surplus. And I think here of all of these stories, we can hear of different people who win the lottery and all of a sudden have these amazing needs in their life for a yacht and a summer home and a vacation home and all these other things that they didn't need before. But now that there's wealth and surplus, they need them. Yet here too, St. Paul is telling us he's experienced that overabundance. But in that, he did not allow those things to hold him. Rather, he held firmly to God above all, so that when he had that abundance, that abundance could be directed back to the giver of all good gifts, God himself. This is why he can finish by saying, I can do all things in him who strengthens me. That's usually one of those phrases you see at sporting events, very out of context, because it doesn't mean you can do whatever the heck you want because of Jesus. It means you can live every situation because God is provident. And if you rely on that providence, no matter the situation, you can endure and be a saint. He goes on then to pray for his people that he is writing to, that God fully supply every need that they will have in accord with the glorious riches in Christ Jesus. He recognizes, St. Paul, that the things of this world are passing away. And so instead we must go to the riches of heaven, which neither fire burns nor moth eats. Those riches which endure, which are always overabundant and which are never lacking if we simply ask for them. Today is uh, the feast of St. Teresa of Avila. And in her own way, she explains this by saying, that the so-called goods of this miserable life are impediments. She is saying that the things that we think are helpful to us in this life, if we hold on to them, they become impediments to true joy and happiness, to freedom. With that phrase, she reminds us what St. Paul does here, that we must be detached from everything except God and the gifts that he desires to give us. Because otherwise, we hold on to those things. We become attached to everything except the Lord, and we end up treating the things of this world, like food, or wealth, or pleasure, or even our own wills, we treat them like idols. They become other gods that we bow down and worship. But the so-called goods of this life are impediments 
if they get in the way of God. Another Carmelite saint, St. John of the Cross, has this beautiful image of a small bird. And he says, whether the bird is tied down to earth by a large heavy rope or a thin small string, in either case, he is not free. He cannot fly away. And the same is true with our hearts. No matter how big or small the, the attachment that we have to something in this life, if it is there, we are not free. We cannot allow our hearts to soar like a bird to the heights of heaven, to receive the nourishment of God, to enjoy the glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Because our hearts are tethered, they are roped down by whatever it might be. Even the smallest bit of pride or envy or jealousy, the smallest amount of self-will, is enough to keep our hearts chained and bound in shackles. So what St. Paul and every saint since him, they tell us today, is to be detached, to allow ourselves to let go, that our hands might be open to receive the gifts of God. If you've received a gift, as I'm sure you have, you realize you can't receive it with your hands clenched on something else, with your fists around something that you want to take and keep. You have to let go of that to receive whatever it might be. And the same is true with God, except in our hearts, we must be open to receive those good gifts. This is why in the Christian tradition, we have things like penance and fasting. It's not simply so that we can make ourselves miserable for a few days a year. It's so that we can learn to let go of the things of this world and cling wholeheartedly to God. Fasting, for example, is not just simply Christian dieting. It's letting go of something that we know is good, that in fact we at times need, so that in that time of fasting we can give ourselves to God. So a lunch at which you are fasting is meant to be given over to prayer or good works, works of mercy and charity, so that that moment when we are giving something up is attuned to heaven. It's given to God. And then we remember that in the first place, that food or that good was from God anyway. And it helps us to direct our hearts, our lunch, our wills, and everything around us to the giver of all good gifts. And then when we are able to eat again or enjoy that good, we do so with an appreciation for the giver of the gift and not simply the gift itself. This helps us as St. Paul to appreciate abundance and to recognize his providence in when we lack anything. As we see in the first reading, Isaiah prophesies that on this mountain, the Lord of hosts will provide for all peoples a feast of rich food and choice wines. This symbolism has permeated the tradition to remind us all the time that God is going to provide for us, whether it be from some monetary or financial issue to the matters of our heart. God will provide at the right time and in the right way that we can live in total trust and confidence upon his providence. This takes place first and foremost here at this altar where we are on Mount Zion, where this prophecy is fulfilled and God provides for all peoples who come to him this feast of rich food, the very body and blood of his own son, that we might come and be nourished, receive that providential care of the Father, and go back into our lives knowing that he cares for us and he will continue to do all things for us that work for his glory and our true good. I pray then with St. Paul this week that God fill everything that you need, that you know not just the passing trials and the empty vanity of the things of this world, but ultimately and always the glorious riches of Christ Jesus. Amen.